an accusation against an elder is not to be received by a witness of two or three. Does that mean two or three people have to witness it at the same time or that there's a pattern of behavior? Either way, th there's got to be a place for people to bring forward their accusation and concern without having to confront that person directly who's actually capable of hurting them worse. Wake up and win. Wake up and win. Wake up and win. Wake up. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Wake Up and Win podcast. Your host, Blaze Frey, missing my beautiful wife, Christina, tonight. She's hanging with the kids. We did not have childcare, so she is hanging with the kids. Um, she's usually with me on these episodes. We will miss her dearly. But stepping in for her tonight, we've got the one and only. <laughs> <laughs> Clear. I'm not stepping in for your wife. <laughs> That's a told, major downgrade. I told, I, told, I told Christina, I said, I said, I'm going to announce it like this. Usually she does the theological teachings. Tonight we're bringing Michael Miller in to do the theological teachings. No, but uh, we've got the one and only Michael Miller from Remnant Radio joining us tonight. Very, very excited to have you on the show, Michael, out of Denver, Colorado, uh, senior pastor of Re Reclamation Church. Uh, welcome awesome. to the show. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, man. Glad to be here. It's really good to have you. I've been, uh, I think I've ran into you guys probably about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and um, just always enjoyed you guys' commentary on stuff. I'll be honest though, I at the time, I was I was not the type of charismatic that liked to judge prophecies and you know I was like man these guys are kind of intense but I'll tell you what man especially over the last like nine months I've been so so thankful for uh, for the bent that you guys have and I'm going these guys were ahead of their time in the direction that they're going. So thank you. Thank you for what you guys did. You are not the only one, uh, just so you know. I think uh, we were hated by every side of the spectrum for those, uh, the first prophetic review videos we did. Um, those who were charismatic thought we were just Harry C. Hunters. And those who were, uh, who were cessationists were angry with us that we didn't call all these people false prophets and heretics. We just weren't willing to, to go there with it. And so... Yeah, I think the yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to be okay with criticizing anything in the charismatic world and uh it takes situations like what you guys have been dealing with to finally like the lights to turn on and go, "Oh my gosh, no, we actually need to be doing this." Yeah, man. Yeah, well, we got connected probably 3-4 months ago. Um you saw one of our shows, I guess, and somehow somebody connected us and and it's just been, you know, it's been a pleasure to connect with you for sure. I was proud of you guys. Um yeah, I, I think I haven't listened to all the ones who have come out and talked about IHOP and whatnot. I, but I, I did. I mean, I've catched a little bit here and there, but I caught your episodes and I was going, these guys are withholding information. They know more than what's going on and they're just trying to comment on what they're allowed to share, at least early on in this. Yeah. And so I immediately reached out to Jono and I was like, hey, do you know this guy? And he's like, yeah. And so that's why I, I reached out to you. I, I'm just proud of you. That's all I can say. I'm glad that you guys decided to be a voice. Um, and, and I, you know, the concern that I've had is who's going to speak to specifically those who are still believing in the prayer movement and disillusioned and don't know what to do with all of this stuff. So uh, yeah, I'm thankful that they've got you guys. Well, man, I know that, uh, and, and we won't, we won't, uh, you know, disclose anything too soon here, but I know that you've been having multiple conversations this week and you, you know, prior, prior to hopping on, the recorded call, you said, man, I'm just heartbroken over what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. And, um, so, and I just want to remind our audience, we are here, you know, it's, it's so wild that we're doing this as, you know, my wife and I, but we're really, our hearts for the body of Christ, specifically the charismatic body of Christ, the prayer movement, all those affected by the prayer movement. And that would, frankly, that would include, include Bethel and, you know, the, the, all the prophetic stream because we all know this all comes from the same the same guys you know in the same background and the same movements of uh, whether it be Branham or Paul Kane or Bob Jones or all the different folks over the years and so our heart truly is to go you know at least for us my wife and I at our podcast we want people to plug into Jesus we want people to get out of this uh, uh, you know kind of deprogram a little bit from maybe the over over uh, Overemphasis on covering and you know following the prophet and you know just 
really push people back into the Lord, but also not to completely cut off the reality of the spiritual gifts and their intimate connection with Jesus in that place of the gifts, also hearing the voice of the Spirit. And I think a lot of that happens when things fall apart like this, you know? And and so um, tonight's episode, we really want to talk in context of what's happening with IHOP, not just a news update and anything like that, but we really wanted to talk about um, I talked to Michael, you know, we talked a little bit about the theology behind how leaders kind of squeeze their way out of these confrontations or out of these situations, whether it be SA or whether it be spiritual abuse or whether it be they're just doing something dumb and they need to be confronted, um, you know, what, whether it be financial situation or whatever. And um, you had some great insight as we kind of talked this out. And I said, well, let's touch on that a little bit. Let's touch on maybe a couple other things. And I know you had your own situation coming out of a, um, a pretty intense church situation where, you know, we won't get into names, details, and all that, but if you want to share as much as you feel at liberty, I know you shared it on your own podcast, but I'd love to kind of, yeah. you give a background of you, and then maybe you can dive into some of these principles, honor culture, these type of things that built up this scenario that we're watching. Sure. Um, I mean, I'll give a, a brief background on my story. Um, you know, I think it's it's been I, I've tried to avoid the names thing, although honestly, that's that's gonna happen. I'm going to be eventually naming names. Um, and it's not I, I told my story and those who needed to know knew. Um, but now I've just had so many other people who are victims that have come forward with their stories. And I just I've been the lightning rod for a lot of that. And I've been the one safe person that they felt like they could could come to because they're terrified of the leadership at that church. And so, um, I will eventually name names and do that. I'm not going to do it tonight, uh, just cause it's not the right timing to do that. There's other conversations I, I feel like I need to have. Um, however, uh, what happened to me was I was a part of a church plant that we really saw ourselves as building this five fold thing. Uh, and we modeled a lot of it off of directly from culture of honor, Danny Silk's culture of honor, which he claims in his book is the recipe for revival. Like they, they believe that they've got the recipe for revival and it's this fivefold thing. Let's say what happened was the, the main guy, he, he was sort of, he was considered the apostle. He would have himself said he was apostolic, but never call himself an apostle. I don't know. You know, you sure. could parse it however you want, but um, yeah, my take on it is he just, felt out of control and and started clamping down and hurting people. And he just, he, he wouldn't listen to critique. He wouldn't listen to correction. Um, and anybody who brought an accusation forward, well, they were just partnering with the accuser of the brethren. And that's been his narrative up until, gosh, this last summer. I, I heard a sermon series he did where he talked about how you know, people who bring accusations are just bitter and wounded. People like you who do podcasts are just... Uh, what are they? Uh, bitterness with makeup on, I think was his exact phrase. And so he saw what I had done as that, just bitterness with makeup on. And, and and that right there is, I think, kind of what we're talking about. It's it's how do you, um, how is it that these that people who do abusive things get away with it? Well, one of the things they do primarily is ad hominem arguments, meaning they don't talk about the facts of what happened. They talk about the character of the person bringing forward their concerns and or accusations and or a truly bitter person who's still saying true things. Like it doesn't matter what they're saying because the heart isn't right. So I think that's where a lot of that comes from. And that's that was my experience and um, the experience of a lot of others who have uh, I've kind of become an advocate for and intend to advocate for even harder than I ever have in the past. So I want to ask you a quick question um, on the lines of, cause we're going to get into the, like, how do you confront a leader? How do you uh, deal with honor culture teachings and, and without, yeah, how, how do you kind of deconstruct that? I want to ask you a question. What would, how would you define uh, spiritual abuse and how do people find figure out that that's happening to them i know that's a very broad question it could go yeah. for for topics for hours and books could be written but give me a basic thing for people to go what is spiritual abuse and how is that happening how would i know if that's happening in my church or to me or my friend or so on and so forth so i don't have a, a good definition of it i borrow from the scholars uh you know i don't i don't i can talk about my experience but that's probably going to fall short of what's actually out there and it's not going to cover all the kinds of abuses that we see. So I actually just sent you 
a little uh, thing that you could probably attach to your um, your show notes. Uh, and it's the remnant radio study guide on a spiritual abuse. And so some of the definitions I found helpful on the study guide were, um, spiritual abuse is the mistreatment of a person who is in need of help and support or increased spiritual empowerment with the result of weakening, undermining, or decreasing that person's spiritual empowerment. So that's David Johnson and Jeffrey Vondervan. Um, another one that I found helpful was Dr. Gary Bashir from a lecture on spiritual abuse at the Bible training center or uh, Bible training.org says spiritual abuse exists when a person or group of people with religious authority use their position of spiritual power to control or dominate another person in the name of God, church, faith, et cetera, et cetera, taking advantage of the person's vulnerability to gratify their own needs in areas like power, intimacy, prosperity, sexual grat gratification, and spiritual fulfillment. That one I think is, probably the most comprehensive definition I've seen. Um, but that handout I just sent you, it has it. a number of good definitions. Um, and again, uh, Dawson, uh, Gerald, who put this uh, study guide together, we, we, often, <laughs> we often contract and rely and pull heavily on Dawson for stuff like this. But I think that last definition is, is a very good one. Um, and I would say if you are trying to diagnose whether you're going through spiritual abuse, I wouldn't go to the leader of your church. Uh, if you're trying to diagnose, if you're experiencing spiritual abuse, it's your leader that probably set up that system. And so your leader is the worst person you could go to when it comes to spiritual abuse. Uh, there's some really great resources out there. Um, there's the subtle power of spiritual abuse. Uh, this is a really helpful book by David Johnson and Jeff Von, Van, Van Vonder, Van Vonderen. I think that's it. Uh, another one, um, I don't have it on my shelf. My wife has been reading it, but I think it's one of the best books I've ever read on the topic. It's called Bully Pulpit. Uh, it's the most concise and well-written, easy to read, and it's just, it's really good. Nice. You know, I think one thing, um, just to kind of wrap up the short little thing here, because we'll attach all those and, and get those resources to people's uh, in our show notes. I think um, what I'm finding, and maybe you can tell me if this would be, uh, true in your circle, but I'm finding that more people are like, number one, it does exist. Okay. I had a pastor ask mm -hmm. me one time when I was talking to him about the IHOP situation, he was literally digging, asking me questions like, how do we know this is true? What's going on there? And so I'm, I'm telling him everything that I've learned and found out. He's like, wow, wow. Then he's like, but well, what about the spiritual abuse thing? What is that? I've been accused of spiritual. What is spiritual abuse? This, this is a pastor, been a pastor for probably 15, 20 years. Sure. He's like, what is spiritual abuse? And I'm going, I'm going, wow, this is, you know, I think, I think it's real easy to, um, for charismatics to go, well, um, you know, okay, so now I got to go read this whole book to see if there's spiritual abuse that exists or like, and for a charismatic, it's like, but all, but I think anecdotal, like in the sense of just, uh, well, just experiential, you have people coming to you. Like, what is the fruit of this, maybe, I'd say, narcissist system that's become set up in the charismatic church where there's a, a big boss leader that the boss leader might even say things like, oh, there's no man of God. There's no man of God here. We're all, you know, kingdom people. But then at the end of the day, you find out that decisions are being made based on prophetic words that may or may not ever come true. And everybody honors that person regardless. And, and then you have this wake. In the wake of these leaders, you have all these people that have fallen away from the faith are just totally wounded. And so does that make sense what I'm saying slash asking? Yeah, are you seeing more I of that? There's, there's two things I want to mention. This is, okay, what, are, what does spiritual abuse look like for a person who's committing it? But then also, what are some symptoms of a person who's probably experiencing it? Um, and, and I'm not a scholar on this topic, just to be really clear. I think my story has, has given me some insight into some of these things. Um, but I, I would say that when you uh, when a person has their authority diminished and they're not given clear explanations as to why, uh, when uh, you find that it's impossible to please the person that you're trying to serve, like there's this moving target that you're always trying to hit and you don't feel like you can ever hit it, um, that's usually a sign of a, a narcissistic or abusive leader. When you find that they, the beginning of the relationship started with love bombing, they may have given you really expensive gifts, uh, paid for trips for you and your family to go on, 
uh, given you a job and and giving you a ton of compliments and acknowledge you publicly in front of everybody. These are all subtle forms of love bombing and they hook you in. You think, I have never felt so honored before in a church. But then soon afterwards, maybe six months later, you find subtle jabs taken at your work. Um, anything, when, when you are feeling like you really did something great, uh, especially that gets criticized. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that is because a narcissistic leader cannot stand somebody outshining them. And so they find really subtle ways to undermine that. Or they'll, they'll move you around, constantly shuffling the pieces. Um, and then also when they start dictating, and this is a big one, this is a big one. They start dictating to you who you can and cannot talk to. When you try to control uh, information, the flow of information, that is a sure sign of toxicity and potential abuse. Um, and I found that to be the most common and most obvious one. Um, I love Jordan Peterson um, because he, one of the things that compelled me to go public with my own story was his conviction that if you don't speak the truth, that's what brings about a dictatorial uh, regime. Most of us in the Christian world, we are we are programmed to think, um, well, you've got to believe the best about this person. Like culture of honor says, love believes all things, right? When somebody sins, it's your job to believe that their motive was good and to believe that they're going to change and believe that God's going to bring about that change. But what it also fails to do is mention how sometimes the way God brings about that change is a person who is being used by God to execute justice and judgment. Like you think about um, when there was a curse on the land of Israel and, because they had been sleeping with the Moabite women. Well, one of the guys finds out who it is, and he spears that man and his wife, and the Lord blesses him because of this. Mm -hmm. And so um, yeah, that, that bit about controlling the flow of information, it also has a subtle message in it that you really can't trust people with facts. Only the leaders are capable of dealing with the facts. Uh, when you control communication, you control power. Power is where the truth lies. I mean, truth is power. And so if you can control who gets to hear what, that's where the power is. So good, Michael. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, I think those little, cause I, I think for people that are listening, they need to hear, okay, have I ever been told in my church? Yeah. Avoid that person, you know, stay away from that guy or those type of things. When I look back and I've had people reach out to me actually, today from my story of 10 years ago, you know, and I, I went public with my story in 2015 and, um, and even my, my understanding of my story and what happened at IHOP KC is so different now in hindsight, seven, eight, well, heck, whatever, nine years later, my understanding and perspective of it all, especially with everything that's come out now. But I have people that reached out and said, Blaze, thank you for your podcast. And I'm, I remember when I was there in the night watch, at that time, when you started posting on social media uh, and just saying different things, I, I was told by this leader, by this leader, do not listen to him, avoid him, don't read his book, don't listen to his stuff, don't like, and, and these, these people told me, they were like, yeah, I got met with because somebody saw me meeting with you guys in a coffee shop. So I got met with every week, at, like yeah. once a week to make sure that I was deprogrammed from my meeting with you guys. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah, it, it's... It's still happening today. Uh, like I'm the scapegoat for every problem that gets exposed. Uh, it, what's been said often is, hey, don't talk to him about theology and don't talk to him about uh, the church that I came out of. Uh, like literally people are told not to talk to me about those things. And if they ever bring forward an accusation that is anything similar <laughs> to what I went through, it's, have you been talking to Michael Miller? They're like, no, I don't even know who Michael Miller is. I just, you had, you do, you did this to me or this person did this. But totally. the flow of communication, there's actually scripture that's used to justify who gets to know what. Talk about that. How are they yeah, doing sure. this? And what's the scriptures people are using and how are they twisting them? And how do you untwist them? Matthew 18, obviously, that's the one everybody, I think, knows. And, and that's probably the one being most uh, talked about right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this idea that if your brother sins, you go to them in private and you try to show your brother their sin. 
If they don't listen to you, you go and get somebody else. And then again, you try to show your brother your sin. If they don't listen to two of you, you get the elders of the church. Uh, and then after that, if they don't repent from their sin, what's bound on earth is bound in heaven, right? They get excommunicated. Um, the problem with that is Matthew 18 is there's no like parameters on that. It's just like any offense. And so people just take it at carte blanche. Uh, what they fail to recognize is when there's power dynamics and they just assume that Matthew 18 applies to every conflict that could ever possibly exist. And the reason why that's so devastating is because it doesn't deal with any kind of trauma. It's hmm. it's not it's not dealing with power dynamics where a person is actually unsafe to go to. That if you go to them, you're going to be gaslit, abused, de deauthoritized, or have financial loss because of confronting that person, or, or they may actually cause you physical harm. And so, uh, like, I would never tell a woman to go and confront her race, rapist and say, hey, you did this to me. Uh, wow. Actually, what you're doing to that victim is actually going to further traumatize them by commanding them to follow through with Matthew 18. And so you can see how everybody who's got um, a wound from some of some offense, especially if it's somebody who's got more power than you, like they they could fire you, so they can they can deal a financial loss to you. They can uh, they control a pulpit, uh, so they literally can speak to millions of people at any given time uh, about you. Um, confronting that person, that's not Matthew eighteen. There there is no world where Matthew eighteen is the appropriate way to go about that. Um, that's why I think churches have to have some sort of whistleblower policy uh, in their church to allow people who don't have power, who are members in a community, to actually express their voice and be heard and not gaslit, discredited, loss of job and loss of reputation, silenced, and then outcast. Um, so that's probably one of the main ones I'd point out. Matthew 18 is the big one that, you know, those that have followed the IOPKC story, that was the immediate thing that the ELT, Stuart Greaves, Dave Slyker, Isaac Bennett, and, and, and those that have been following real closely, you can put it together, that first statement from the stage, they said, we trust in the leadership of Jesus. That was the phrase they used. We trust in the leadership of Jesus through this it's process. Great spiritual language to dismiss everything. And you know, and you know what they it meant. Means nothing. It meant we're doing Matthew eighteen, and Matthew eighteen was said by Jesus. So that's his leadership. We will follow that process. Is is the implication, and that implication led to allowing Mike Bickle to turn away every person that came to him, left and right and require Jane Doe's to come to him or give their stories to him. And and so we see the mess that that made over 125 days and how it's all oh unraveling gosh. now. And so now, you know, I said this early on, I said, if the church can't listen to these people because they're going to say they're lying or they're bitter or this, then they're going to have to listen to the secular media. It's going to come out in secular media. It's going to come out in reports and all this stuff. Um, you, you hit the nail on the head, requiring victims to do that is asinine and it is further traumatizing to victims. But I also got to say there were victims who did that. The amount of courage it took those women, like these women need to be lauded and praised, not shunned for exposing. Like they, they deserve a great deal of honor. They are the true heroes in the story. I'm just, I'm blown away by that. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're exactly right, man. You're exactly right. Uh, the fact that they did do that at, at the beginning and Jane Doe's husband included just the whole process and just, it's, uh, it's heart, it's heart wrenching. So let me ask you this on that note, you know, some people will say, well, we don't want to add pop psychology to the conversation. Why would we do that? You know, and we've got the Bible, et cetera. So when you start to talk about a power dynamic or, um, like, how would you kind of approach that conversation when people say, well, it doesn't give any caveat for a power dynamic or a this, that, or the other, um, just, just show up and confront him privately, then bring two and then, you know, just stick with the, the straightforward. What would you say to that? We don't want to incorporate pop psychology. Yeah. Yeah. In the sense of like, uh, some people say like, um, that a lot of the idea of power dynamics in, 
and in religious structures or i mean we'll just stick with the religious structure the idea of clergy abuse or spiritual abuse it's like okay so now you're going to add in this power dynamic idea and because it's unsafe well why would that allow you to 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 break what we're seeing straightforward in Matthew 8. I mean, I saw this from Stuart Greaves saying yeah. this, from Isaac Bennett saying you. this. Yeah, the, the thing is, there's also plenty of Proverbs that would say the opposite. The scriptures aren't super clear cut on this. It's either this way or this way. So like, if you go through all the Proverbs, it also talks a lot about um, approaching the fool mm. and uh, approaching a wicked person. Um, and those don't go out go so well. And the warning in the, the Proverbs is don't do that. You've also got passages like don't throw your pearls before swine who will just trample over them. Um, so there is also a place where going to that person to try to confront them is only going to be trampled on and leave you in a worse place. So Matthew 18 isn't the only verse out there about how this stuff is to be conducted. Um, you know, even if you use the the passage, I think it's in first Timothy five about how an elder is not to be, uh, uh, an accusation against an elder is not to be received by a witness of two or three. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean two or three people have to witness it at the same time, that one event, or that there's a pattern of behavior? Um, but either way, th there's got to be a place for people to bring forward their accusation and concern without having to confront that person directly who's actually capable of hurting them worse. Right. And it's the other part is you've got structures that the Bible also doesn't endorse, which by the way, IHOP had a structure that the Bible didn't endorse. That's, that's a key thing there. Your structure itself just disqualified uh, scriptures. Like it made it impossible for leaders to be confronted because this, the, the structure itself had people in silos with only one person that everyone had to answer to. And so I, I'm like, I'm sorry here, but how, how is Matthew 18 supposed to apply in a place that has an unbiblical structure? Uh, I, I like what you said there, just overall with the understanding that Matthew 18 in a confrontational setting is not the only scripture to take into account. I love that you pulled from the Proverbs because frankly, you know, my wife and I have been talking about this and she was like, we were talking about honor culture. We were talking about covering. And, and I mean, you know, real big right now is, is John Bevere and his, you know, he's out there right now with the fear of the Lord book and this, that, and the other. And, and the bait of Satan. Yeah, bait is, well, yeah basically, if you, you have an accusation, you're Satan. You're just taking Satan's bait. Yeah, that Talk about a way to gaslight victims, keep narcissistic people in power so that they never get confronted. It's like... Well, dude, you just add crazy pills. You add a couple of you add a couple of um, you know charismatic testimonies behind how when people did it, this happened in their life and everything fell apart. And when people didn't, they honored the authority and never didn't confront or didn't say this, that, or the other. Their life went really well, etc. You add a couple of those stories, and wow, this is how it works. But it's I don't think compelling. it's yeah, it's very compelling in the book. But when you look at life, you go, wait a second. Um, who put this person in a, and I think especially this is probably a broader topic that we don't probably won't dive fully into here. And you guys may have podcasts about it, but just overall authority and structure in the charismatic church and how you kind of look at, you know, you have these different systems set up and, and the lack of accountability in many of, like you said, like an IHOP type of situation, or, you know, I don't know what all the different ones out there, how they set up their structures, but I will say the idea of honor culture really, really comes from the same idea of the covering and the the uh, bait of Satan and all that to where everybody in the flock is a bunch of dumb sheep and you got one or two or three that they're hearing from God. And even if you think you're hearing from God, you're probably not, especially if you can't submit it to them and they agree that it is. And uh, you know we're kings yeah. and priests in the body of Christ. It's neo-Catholicism all over again. You've got a pope at the top and everybody else, they're just dumb sheep. Priesthood of all believers, this cardinal reformation doctrine that we've adopted as Protestants, charismatics, just got thrown out. Uh, we've rebranded Catholic Church. Let's go into that. I want you to hit that idea, if you would, just honor culture sure. and untwisting that. And you told me a while back, you said where I was at the former church I was at, where a lot of this stuff unfolded, you said... To me, you said, "Blaze, I taught the honor culture to everybody. I taught the the paradigm." Oh, yeah. So, so tell me how you untwisted from that, and tell me what it is for those that don't know. So, I think we need to we need to separate two things. There is a book called Culture of Honor by Danny Silk out there, and I think it's got some really bad stuff. 
but I wouldn't say he would endorse this other thing called honor culture, which yeah. is in most charismatic communities, but it's also everywhere. Um, in, in the evangelical and in liturgical and in Catholicism. Um, and this honor culture thing is if I was to, to point out Danny Silk's book or teachings from other popular guys, like, uh, you know, the guys who say stuff like, uh, I can't be offended. I'm already dead. Um, like that kind of stuff. Christians, we just, we ooze Christ. And therefore, when it comes to being offended, well, you can, if you're offended, it's because you haven't crucified your flesh on some level. Um, and so that idea, what it does is it teaches people that when they are sinned against, them having a problem with being sinned against is their problem. So that's that's a form of gaslighting or blame shifting. It makes the person who's the victim, the perpetrator. Um, and so uh, honor culture will say stuff like, hey, don't touch the Lord's anointed. And they take that completely out of context because the, the fact is that passage, don't touch the Lord's anointed, is about David not killing and usurping Saul. Um, it has nothing to do with exposing a person who's in sin. In fact, the Bible tells us to expose people in sin. Right. And actually, there's guilt on our heads for failing to do so. There's another thing called a sin of omission, which is where you fail to do the right thing and speak up when you should. Matter of fact, you can see examples in Scripture of people falling under a curse for failing to do the right thing. Uh, and then those the curse being lifted when somebody actually does the right thing. So uh, honor cultures, the other thing that you would see is this idea of like, well, we should believe the best about this person, right? God's got them. God's going to judge them. I think The Tale of Three Kings is a book that's been super super popularized, right? It's like, hey, man, David was sinned against. He did nothing, and the Lord did this thing. And um, it just assumes that God is going to sovereignly do this thing. It's, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's like the, uh, you know, the continuationists out there who say, I'm continuationist, but they don't actually experience any miracles. Like they're waiting for God to sovereignly step down from heaven and heal somebody. Right. It's the same thing, but just replace healing and miracles with justice. Mm. It's like you're just waiting on God to sovereignly bring about justice instead of actually being used by God to bring about justice. And to be very clear, I'm not for getting vengeance. I'm not saying you should go and take justice into your own hands. I am saying that there is a place for us to be used by God to bring about justice, exp uh, exposition of sin. These Jane Doe's did exactly that. Although sadly, I don't think they're going to get justice because Mike is unrepentant in his sin. Yeah. Um, but honor culture would dissuade a person from speaking up at all. They would say silence is a virtue and they fail to recognize that silence can also be a sin. And so it's this sort of polarized view of silence being a vir virtue without ever actually using your voice to expose things when that's the right and appropriate thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. Oh, that the believe the best about them, that somehow God is going to miraculously get them to change their heart, which that sometimes happen, but also sometimes they harden their heart. That's true. Like Pharaoh, they go deeper into their sin and you've actually allowed them to continue committing that sin against others by a failure to speak up and speak out. And so uh, like when people leave a church because they've undergone some source, sort of, they, they've acknowledge that the a pastor is an abusive leader and they leave I'm like, yeah, well, God's got this situation. And I'm like, no, see, that's, that's exactly the problem is you're enabling that person. Mm -hmm. uh, you're enabling that person to stay in their sin by your silence and just leaving quietly. When in fact, you should be sounding the alarm on your way out. I feel like, and you guys, you know, you guys are, I, I think you, your crew, you guys are interconnected with lots of different parts of the body of Christ and the charismatic movement specifically. And you kind of paying attention to what's going on and what you feel like the Lord's speaking, you know, in, in a confirmed way of what's happening. I would say, and maybe you can confirm this or, or not, but um, I get the sense so deeply, Michael, that God is raising up so many people be it through podcasts, Jehus. be it through, yeah, bro, it's just like the Pagani yeah. word, I just, I, about Jehu and the digital Jehus and all that, I see it everywhere and I kind of have this sense, it's like, yeah, obviously with my wife and I, we're just, we're speaking out in our small pocket here, but the, sure. I look across the body of Christ and I go, 
there are so many sad situations that have been hidden. I get, man, Michael, I got a phone call three days ago. A guy texts me, I need to talk to you right now if you're open to it. So-and-so recommended me talk to you. And it was a trustworthy source. I said, yes. We get on the phone, gives me the name of a very, very well-known, large leader in the body of Christ. Everybody would know in the charismatic movement. And um, you and I could probably compare notes. Because- oh, God, yeah. And I just like, I'm like, Lord, like how? But, but, but the sad thing is that when he said it, I went, oh, that's why the Lord put this in my heart. Uh, a couple months ago, and I did. I wasn't a hundred percent sure, and I do, frankly, give people the benefit of the doubt. I try to until, until you give me a reason to swing. I'm not going to swing. You know, I, I'm like, I want to. I want to know. It's. A, it's a, uh, yeah. Sorry, it's a double standard when it comes to giving people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I want to believe the best about pastors who are accused of abuse. I also want to believe about believe the best about the person who brought forward an accusation. It is a total double standard. We right. rush to protect the leader and fail to listen to the person bringing forward the accusation. And the fact is there are teachings out there that say, if you accuse, you're just partnering with the accuser of the brethren. That's literally everything that Mike taught for about two months leading up to when the first oh, allegation came dude, out. I'm telling you, I've, I've heard sermons from my old pastor and boss, same thing. He's still using those kind of things. I mean, you could st- go find these online. I think you can look uh, at the, he knew there were allegations against him and he uh, he gave a prophetic word saying, batten down the hatches, we're coming against the accuser of the brethren. Wow. Like he literally had just been told, there are a lot of people that are terrified of you. They've told me stories. And he came home from that and started grooming his audience with this new prophetic word, said, we're coming against the accuser of the brethren. And so I, I think it's all over, man. I, I really do think it's everywhere. And I think this is, I, I, you know, I've said this it's before. It's going to get kind of um, messy. I think. W- what we've found is uh, social media has a lot of downsides and negative effects on our psyche, right? There's no doubt about it. It also is the only reason for why this stuff is finally getting exposed. Right. The stuff with Mike, that ELT team would have done nothing had it not been for YouTube. Had it not been for Instagram, like quite literally nothing would have happened. I I agree with that a thousand percent, Michael. I would love to have thought something different, but what I knew already from personal experience and what I saw happening on stage and what I knew from behind the scenes while that was happening, I went, no freaking way. And this, yeah. they're just going to do this. They're going to literally slow roll this and fix everything and then everything's going to be back to normal. But we put the pressure on left, right, and everywhere. The Jane Doe's, the Tammy Woods story came out, TH, like Julie Royce, us, you guys threw some stuff in there. Like not only that, but what I loved about the whole thing in in the sense of the the justice realm was that Twitter army that just kind of, that all, I I told Walter of inquiry, go get it. Uh, Steven yeah, Deer. Man. I was oh, so proud Steve of him. Deer. Like, like what happened was that Mike had actually, through this prophetic movement, groomed a group of people to lay down their lives in a volunteerism spirit. And 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 it came back to haunt him because most people out there are just like, you know what? I'll stay up half the night listening to old Bickle sermons to find how he was grooming people and I'll post it. And that goes viral. I'll, I'll, I'll dig deeper into what the ELT is saying versus what's really happening and I'll post it. And like, it was an uncontrolled firestorm. And, um, and, and it's not a, I'll say this too. It wasn't a burn the house down movement. This was not about burning the house down. It was about exposing the burning house. That's what it was about, right. exposing the burning house so that there could be true justice and vindication for, and I don't know what vindication and justice looks like, man. Like for these Jane Doe's, my heart's broken for them. I, I don't, don't know what it looks I don't like. Think there's justice on this side of the resurrection. Do I think God can redeem it? Absolutely. There are some things though in life that, that like when, when a life is taken or uh, when innocence is taken, there's no restoring that on this side of the resurrection. There just isn't. And the thing that gets me is like people give these apologies. Yeah, I've made mistakes or I'm sorry, I I did this 25 years ago. But when it comes to actually being willing to pay the price for your sin, where's the Zacchaeus? Where's the guy saying, if I've stolen, I'll pay back four times as much. It seems like so much sin gets glossed over. And the, the quickness with which people want to, like the Chris Valentin or Rick Joyner, 
they want to they want to immediately go towards restoration of Mike Bickle. And I'm thinking, hold on, why aren't you saying that about the victims? Why are you not rushing to help out and restore victims? And the fact is, we all know now there's probably more out there. And what kind of fund are you setting aside? And what kind of responsibility are you going to take on? Because if you're willing to go straight to restoring the perp and, and fail to call them a perpetrator, you're part of the problem. You are. I'm naming names there. I'm sorry. But that just makes me so angry. Yeah. Well, well, clearly with Rick Joyner, he said the word restore Mike Bickle, like just as of two days ago or yesterday. And, and Valentin said, I love Mike Bickle. And, you know, regardless, he's my brother, kind of this type of thing. Then he apologized for not apologize a few days later, but his apology never really mentioned, like he, he literally used the words. What is Mike Bickle? What has he done? I mean, he was Jane Doe. I mean, I went, I went, did you guys not read the February 8th, 2024 IHOP KC statement where they said, Mike Bickle has done this. We believe Jane Doe and we believe Tammy Woods and we are deeply sorry and we regret everything. Yeah. It's like, can't, why, why not just say the words, um, Mike was a pedophile, right? This is the big thing that gets me is we don't want to actually use the words to explicitly talk about their sin. Right. Mike was a pedophile and a perpetrator. Um, Chris, those are the words you need to say to those victims. You need to apologize for that, for not naming his sin for what it actually is. Um, I got to jump in here too. You know, I think um, that part of the problem, and you can speak to this as, as far as what you see, but you know, I come from a very conservative background, it's ultra conservative. I grew up in Texas, like right wing conservative Republican. And, and uh, I'm still very conservative in my thought process in many ways in politics. But I will say <clears throat> what I watch when these things come to light is I watch this divide happen. You have the pointing of the finger to anybody that sides with the victim. They're the woke mob or Me Too movement. And you have the, hey, let's protect this guy the same way we had to protect you know, this politician or this situation, and we don't want the woke mob to win without, you know, due process and this, that, and the other. And I'm going, the lack of education that, <clears throat> that frankly, I had in my, you know, 2016 to 2020, 2021 21 years uh, was that I didn't realize how many women never come forward. They, oh, ne yeah. they never come forward. And I didn't realize why fully until I started to meet people that these things have happened to and they haven't come forward. And I'm going, Oh, you mean there's nothing to gain from this? You mean it's going to possibly, like, you'll get doxxed online. Your family will get, like, your kids will have, you, it will ruin your kids. It could ruin your family. It could, oh, and you haven't, and I'm not saying anybody out there in the, I'm just saying there's, there's situations where people hadn't even told their spouse, you know, in churches. Sure. And, like, it's Dude. a. Look at yeah. this. The, this, one of the stories, again, from my old church, uh, one of the victims that, that have come forward to me and said, I tried to approach the leader. This one woman had been approached by a man in the church to be his mistress and basically go and, you know, have sexual activity with this person. Uh, and the pastor, when he heard these allegations, his response was, you're dishonoring. So, whoa, you hear that? So like the, the dishonor was the first thing thrown. The person brought forward a concern they go to their pastor to tell them, hey, pastor, uh, this has happened. And the pastor responds by instead of going, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. And he doesn't give them the benefit of the doubt. Instead, he says, you're dishonoring this person. You should go directly to them. And then he does it for them. So instead of you know, a man comes to the pastor to warn him about a wolf, and the pastor responds by handing him over to the wolf. And, he, and that's not the only place I, I was literally taught to do these things in these churches, both by example and by explicit uh, command. Like, hey, if you hear these things, here's what you're supposed to do. Oh and it's like, the, it's so, so egregious. And so, of course, why do people not want to come forward? Well, so-and-so did it and look what happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. And I, I, I'm hoping, my hope in these things and my prayers that, um, the Lord would give us tender hearts in the body of Christ and an awakening to 
the, the reality of speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, you know, judge rightly. And I think that's where we miss it as the body of Christ. We, we look at the leader that's anointed, that has the prophetic word, the history, the teachings, the, the, the books, and you're going, well, there's no way that we can just throw that guy all the way out or throw all of his ministry right. all the way out based on this person. We don't know. They, they may not have credibility. Even the idea of credibility, what is that? Like, I don't care if a guy, this perfect preacher abused a absolute lying drug addict it's it, it's still a re, like it's still a reality you know yeah, what don't I mean? use the ad hominem of whether just a drug addict exactly. to dismiss the allegation exactly so i'm saying for all the way from hey a ministry platformed person that could be perfect in the eyes of the body of christ all the way to the to the point of a person that's a complete atheist and total like maybe they maybe they have a murderer in the past. It's like I don't care where the pendulum slings on the person that's the victim. We've got to immediately see them as equal immediately. Not like well this guy's got great teaching so I trust him. They're just trying to you know kill him. You know they're just trying to take him down. Or this person is. It's like we've yeah. got to see the value of human life and those who cannot speak for themselves. You know, that was the scripture that came to me early on was it's Proverbs 31 something, seven and eight. It's also in Deuteronomy. It's quoting Deuteronomy. There you go. Judge righteously. Speak for those who can't. Well, people would say, well, Blaze, Michael, they can speak for themselves. You don't understand the power dynamic and the silence. The clergy sexual abuse. The average age that a woman comes out is age 52. 52 years old. And that could have happened in their teenage years when they were in their 20s, 30s. And it's not because they're coming oh. out to get money. But frankly, I believe they all should get money because they're because they've been stolen oh, from absolutely. for years. Uh, you should be paying all of their therapy bills, all of the trauma therapy they've had to go through. You should be yeah. paying for, for that for however many years it takes because you're the one responsible for that pain. Yeah. Um, something I was going to mention. So you, you talk about speaking up for those who don't have a voice. You, one of the things I love... Uh, I've been going through the book of Deuteronomy with my church. Uh, we literally go line by line, verse by verse. We're 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 just wrapping up Deuteronomy 31. So we're, we've been going through this for about a year now. But one of the things you find over and over and over again, repeated throughout the entirety of De Deuteronomy, is God making provision for the orphan, the poor, the foreigner. And the widow, and the widow is the divorcee, not just a woman who's lost her husband to death, but the divorcee, the one who was on her own, because mm -hmm. this group has no voice for themselves. This group is actually not capable of fending for themselves, especially in the ancient world. And so yet God has to remind Israel over and over again, when Moses is giving this, it's, a, it's three sermons that Moses gave the people of Israel before they cross over the Jordan. And over and over again, he just keeps bringing up the same group of people. You notice that you won't find anything? Um, you won't find a single admonition for protecting the privileged. You won't sign, find a single admonition for protecting those who are in power. You don't find that in there. You do find over and over again, the people who don't have power being the major focal point of the Lord's concern and Moses' concern to the people of Israel. Um, something that you also mentioned is what happens to victims and the reason they don't come forward is they're also taught and, and we've we've heard this. What was said about the victims who came forward? They're just bitter and wounded. Okay, the pastor from my old church he preached a message this last year about the um, root of bitterness, and in it he quotes from Hebrews twelve and says, you know, hey, a root of bitterness will defile many. And then he defines what a root of bitterness looks like. A root of bitterness. Here's how you know if you have a root of bitterness. You see that person, you want to walk the other way. Or you see them on Instagram and you start asking the question, God, how could you bless that person? Um, that's a person who's got a root of bitterness. Well, sadly, that's also a person who's showing the signs of trauma. That's a person who's actually afraid of you. <laughs> like that, that's a person who's scared and hurting. Um, but then he goes on and it gets worse. He says, and if you've got a root of bitterness, it defiles many. You know, you get on a plane and somebody's smoking on a plane back in the old days. Well, if you're on that plane, even if you're not the one smoking, you could be in the far back, you're going to be defiled by that smoke. And, uh, that person who's got this root of bitterness is just, um, they have either demons in them or on them or around them. And if you get near them, you're going to be defiled by those demons. Yeah. So here's what you've just done. He's just taken this person who's already wounded and victimized and traumatized, you've committed the act of Darvo. You deny, accuse, and you reverse the victim uh, offender order and made that victim out to be the perpetrator 
And then furthermore, you've isolated the victim. Now nobody wants to hear your story. You just effectively shut down the potential for accusation and communication. And so now that person feels isolated and alone. And here's the really kicker of it is, is a root of bitterness is not talking about somebody who's just got bitter feelings at having been betrayed. He actually gives you the example right after. He says, like Esau, he, he gives you the example of who had a root of bitterness. Right. Well, Esau was a reprobate man. He was He lived like an unbeliever. Uh, the root of bitterness, as it's used the very first time, this is an important little note, the first time you see something in a book of the Bible, it usually is telling you something. So like the first time you see the word love is when God tells Abraham to sacrifice the son whom you love, which tells us that love has something to do with sacrifice, right? Well, the first time you see the word root of bitterness used has to do with false teachers. So what's a sinful reprobate person going to do? Well, he's going to lead you into sin. That's wow. how you're defiled. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have bitter feelings, and I'm not justifying feeling bitter. We're told to put away all bitterness, but realize even the Lord himself felt bitterness. We read that when it, in, uh, in uh, the Old Testament, when God felt bitterness at the sins of Israel. So having bitter feelings is not the wow. indication of having sin. That's I mean, a bomb it, it's, right there. It's, it's the, the feelings of being deeply betrayed. And yeah, we're supposed to put that off, but you're not in sin just because you feel those feelings. And you sure, certainly, if you see somebody who's bitter, like they're they're dealing with those feelings of betrayal, you don't push them away being afraid to be defiled by them. You draw near to them because what they actually need to do is they need to have somebody believe their story. That's yeah. what helps them not feel those feelings anymore. So, I'm sorry, I, again, that, I'm so fucked, but that, these are some of my hobbies oh, right here. Dude, come on. That was, that was strong. And the first mention principle is huge on the... Uh, on the, the, the bitterness thing. And then even mentioning that the Lord felt bitterness, you know, it's like, whoa, like, because that, that'll scare some people, but you know, God's not afraid of our emotions. He's not afraid, especially in the world of, you know, uh, being traumatized in any way, shape or form, spiritually, abu spiritual abuse or essay happening or clergy essay, like these things are so massive that if you don't feel something, if you don't feel anger, if you don't feel a little bit of like, uh, pain and, and the results of that pain, you're not, human. You're not alive, you know? And it's yeah. like that. And I, I like to call back what you said earlier and I know exactly who you're talking about. We won't name names, but guys stand up on stage. If you're offended, you're just not dead enough yet. Oh you know? my gosh. That makes me so angry. It doesn't make sense. And it's, it really, and I think that Jesus, you know, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, he understood our life in the dirt. Yeah. He understood this, this process. And I love the power of the new creation life. I love the power of the gospel. I love the Holy Spirit indwelling, but it does not bypass. And this is a word that's, you know, probably more used in the secular world about the spiritual world is, is spiritual bypassing. Something bad happens and you just kind of use spiritual language to cover up the feelings and emotions of it while you push down really what's going on inside. And eventually that's going to bottle up and, and spew out. You've got to it's be allowed. It's called minimize. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. You got you to feel it and you got to let others feel it and not be like, hey, you're bitter. You're, you're, you're mad. Don't say that. Stay away from them. They're going to make you. It's like, no, oh, you know what? Let, let's hear it's it out. Hear them. Yeah. yeah. Let's help them. Let's hear it out. And maybe... Maybe they're actually not bitter. Maybe actually there's something that needs to be confronted that you're missing. I, something I didn't catch when early on is I, I feel like I'm guilty of a lot of these things, honestly, from, from my past. Before this stuff happened to me, there were things I just didn't get. Like I would see a, a woman who's got accusations is displaying the signs of somebody who's bitter and angry. Okay. I would look at that and think, oh, they're just bitter and wounded. They need to get over their bitterness and wounding. They need to forgive. Um, what I was doing was displaying the signs of somebody who is completely ignorant when it comes to trauma. Um, here, here's the thing. Those people who are feeling those feelings, they don't want to be feeling those feelings. They actually want to put all of those things away and they don't know how, but part of the reason they're, they keep talking about it. Part of the reason they haven't been able to get past it is because usually what happens is they haven't been believed they still feel like they're having to prove it to others. And they're just fighting so hard. Somebody's got to believe me. This really happened to me. And that's why they're doing that. I didn't know that. I, I, I would have just dismissed it just like everybody else. 
And now I go, oh my gosh, when you actually spend time with these people and you hear their stories and you say, hey, I believe you, I'm so sorry, what can I do to help? That's it. That's everything. That means the world to them. Um, take two people, take two women. This was uh, uh, the Place We Find Ourselves podcast. I thought this was so helpful. He takes two young women who, and it's just an example, this isn't a real life thing, but two young women who experienced abuse from an uncle. Uh, the first one goes to her dad and she says, dad, um, uncle so-and-so uh, abused me. Uh, he did these things to me. Dad says, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I will never let that happen to you again. I am here to help you and I'm here to protect you. And we will make sure that he, that he's brought to justice. Okay. That, that woman, the chances of recovery are amazing. That woman will actually grow up being stronger. That's what the statistics show, that she'll actually have a strength and resolve that she wouldn't have had without that trauma because it was dealt with. Take the other woman. She comes to dad, say, uncle did this abuse to me. That dad says, sweetheart, uh, that did not happen. In fact, I, I find that so offensive that you would even say those words. And please stop talking to people about this because by talking about it, you're going to bring uh, uh, accusations against our family. You're going to bring shame and dishonor. Notice the honor word there. You're going to bring shame and dishonor on our family. That woman is going to grow up never trusting her own emotions, never trusting her own feelings, and is going to experience lifelong post-traumatic stress disorder from that trauma. Wow. Well, and there you have it. And you translate that family situation to the body of Christ. And I think that's our answer on how we resolve these things internally as a family, as a body of Christ family, whether it's a spiritual abusive situation, spiritual abusive situation, or somebody's telling a story about something that happened to them in the prophetic community. They prophesied this, they lied to me this, they stole from me this, they you know, took my, my freedom in this way, that way, or the other. We need to learn to listen. And if you're in a church or a community where the pastoral leadership, eldership, when these things come to the surface or these stories come about, if they move them to the side, if they minimize them, and if they tell you to avoid those people, then what we know is they're doing the very opposite of what scripture begs us to do, which is to listen to them and speak up for them and defend them, listen. And so, um, and all the way, to, of course, to the, the essay situations and how we defend those people and listen to those people. So I think there's a lot of meat here that we extracted tonight. And uh, I, I really appreciate you kind of- was I too fiery and angry in my head? Not enough, actually. I was actually hoping you'd be a little bit more bitter, Michael. I was like, man, this guy's supposed to be bitter. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you, you did great as usual, and I really, really appreciate you kind of pulling those threads on those scriptures. That was, that was gold. So, um, guys, follow Michael at The Remnant Radio on YouTube, as well as, are you on Twitter or Facebook? I don't really do much. I, I the only thing I do on my my Facebook or Instagram is show pictures of smoked meats that I've just cooked for, or pictures of my kids. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> follow for like smoked really meat recipes. To follow. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, we really appreciate you, man. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna shut down here, but I, I do appreciate you hopping on and just uh, any final thoughts, man. Any final thoughts for the people? I mean, you gave a lot tonight. Anything else you want to throw in? One thing is, I'd say if you if you notice somebody who's displaying those signs of bitterness or woundedness, um, realize that it's not just one person that likely hasn't believed them; it's a whole community. Wow. And um, draw near to them. And if you think of people even now as you've heard this, that you go, "Wow, you know, I remember so and so told me this, and I just I just didn't feel comfortable even talking to them." Um, reach out to them. It's never too late. The, one of the the worst things that I experienced when I left my former church was I felt every phone call that never came. It was a, it was a death by a, a thousand failures <laughs> of people to call. Wow. And so do that. Pick up the phone, call this person, and just say, you know what? I failed you, and I'm sorry about that. Can I hear your story again? What can I do to help? All right, guys, with that, thanks for tuning in. Um, don't forget to subscribe, share this video if you think it's going to help people. We love you. Until next time, peace out, everybody.